Well, good morning. It's lovely to be uh, with you this morning. Um, uh, as Dale said, my name's David. I um, am the assistant pastor at Arnold Road uh, Evangelical Church in the north of uh, Nottingham. Uh, I've uh, been there for um, just over a year. Um, before that, we were, um, I was studying uh, at a Bible college in the north of London for a few years. Um, I'm married uh, to Lauren, uh, and we have three children. Uh, Joshua is seven, uh, Sophia is five, and Reuben is three. Uh, they're sad not to be able to be uh, with you this morning. Um, uh, my wife had other um, commitments at Arnold Road, but um, it's great to be uh, with you um, today. Um, please do turn back, if you have a Bible, uh, to Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, we're going to be focusing on uh, just on one verse today, on, on verse 24. Um, uh, we don't uh, often do that generally in, in churches in this country, but it's but sometimes it's great just to, to really dig deep into one verse. Um, but we'll be using uh, the rest of um, uh, the, the passage around it to, to, to help us to understand uh, what that is saying. So please do turn back uh, to Hebrews uh, chapter 9. Uh, while you turn that, I'm just going to have a drink. Uh, we're approaching uh, the Christmas season, aren't we? Uh, Christmas, uh, the time uh, when Jesus came to earth. Except, where is he now? Uh, he's not here, is he? he, he he's not on earth uh, anymore. I, I wonder, have you ever wished uh, that Jesus was still here on earth? Have you ever thought, if only I could see Jesus in the flesh? then I wouldn't have to doubt. Uh, instead, I could have great assurance uh, that God really did keep his promises uh, and that I can know him through Jesus. Uh, well, our verse this morning is going to show us that it is actually for our good that he is not still here on earth. And it will show us that we wouldn't want him to be anywhere else uh, other than than where he is uh, right now. It is precisely because he is not here on earth, uh, but is with the Father in heaven, that we can have great assurance that we have access to God and are able to enter into his presence. Uh, before we get into um, our verse, let me paint a picture for you of what had to be done to access God's presence before Jesus came. Uh, this gets quite complicated, so bear uh, with me. Uh, inside the Jewish temple, there's a, the top right picture uh, is, is an artist's impression of, of what we think the, uh, the temple would have looked like. Um, and inside the temple, there were different levels of how close you could get to God. That's what the diagram there on the left is showing. Uh, the two closest levels uh, were the holy place where only priests could go, and the most holy place, or, or the holy of holies, uh, where the Ark of the Covenant lived, which symbolized God's presence here on earth. Uh, separating the holy place and the most holy place was a huge, uh, thick curtain. And once a year, the high priest could go through that curtain into the most holy place. That's um, uh, being pictured there in the bottom uh, right. Uh, he could only go in on this one day, the Day of Atonement, and nobody else uh, could go through. Uh, this was as close as anyone could get to being in uh, God's presence. Uh, now have a listen um, to some of what needed to happen in order for the high priest to be allowed to go through into God's presence, uh, to atone or, or make amends uh, for the people's sins. Um, you won't take all of this in. There is a lot uh, here, uh, but just listen to the complexities of it. I'm going to read a passage from Leviticus uh, chapter 16. You can turn there if you want to, um, or, or you can just listen. Uh, I'm going to read uh, Leviticus 16 from verse 2. And the Lord said to Moses, 
Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark, so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. But in this way, Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarment on his body and he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. Then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. Are you following all of this? Uh, Aaron, uh, it goes on, Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself, and he shall take a censer full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord, and two handfuls of sweet incense beaten small, and he shall bring it inside the veil, and put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony, so that he may not die. And he shall take some of, his, some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side. And in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. And then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, at sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleannesses of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins. And so he shall do for the tent of meeting which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleannesses. No one may be in the tent of meeting from the time he enters to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and has made atonement for himself and for his house and for all at the assembly of Israel. And so it goes on. There are still more things to be done. That wasn't the end of Aaron's day. Did you get all of that? This was what had to be done in order to enter into God's presence, so that the sins of all the people could be atoned for. Everything had to be done just right. The high priest had to wear certain clothes. He had to wash in a certain place. Specific animals had to be brought, some whose blood had to be spilt, others who could be set free. And all of this had to be done in the right order, taking the blood into the most holy place so that the high priest could be accepted into God's presence so that he didn't die, and so that he was then able to atone for the people's sin. This was because it was such an awesome thing to enter into God's presence. And nothing dirty or sinful could go near him. So everything had to be done just right. So that Aaron, as the high priest, was clean. And so that he was then able to atone for the sins of the people. Just imagine for a moment that you are an Israelite. And you're outside watching the preparations uh, take place for this to happen. Uh, You know what needs to happen. You watch him bathe, then put the special garments on. You see the bull and the goats there ready. Uh, You know that the high priest is going in for you. You know the danger he's going through. Uh, They used to tie a rope onto him so that if he died while he was in there, they could pull him out because no one would have been able to go in to retrieve his body. 
But then imagine the joy you would have felt when you saw him come out and you saw that goat being sent away into the wilderness as a sign that your sin was being taken far, far away. Then imagine the disappointment that night after you've sinned yet again and you know that it will all have to happen again in a year's time. This was what was needed for anyone to come near to God. And it was so difficult and it didn't last. You didn't have free, unhindered access to God. And then, after this went on for hundreds and hundreds of years, a 33-year-old Jewish man was killed on a cross. That curtain blocking people from the most holy place was torn in two from top to bottom. As Jesus hung on the cross, as his blood was poured out, God accepted his blood. He accepted his sacrifice and announced that no other sacrifice is needed. He ripped that curtain up. Universal access to God has been achieved. It doesn't need to be repeated and we don't now need a high priest to go through all of these rituals. Jesus has done it. But where is he now? Did he go behind that curtain? Is that why it tore? Why can't we see him anymore? He came back to life, didn't he? Couldn't he have stayed to convince people to trust him? His job was finished, right? Surely he'd have been more use if he had stayed here on earth. Well, we're going to see this morning that the fact that we can't see him uh, does not mean that he doesn't care. Uh, but he is actually working for us now. It is good that he is not here on earth anymore. Uh, we're going to see that an appearance in heaven achieves for us access uh, to God. Uh, so firstly, we'll see an appearance in heaven. Uh, let me read our verse again. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Where has Christ gone? Well, our verse says that he didn't go into the, holy, the, into the most holy place. That was just a copy a model of something supremely greater, a model of heaven itself. You see, God didn't live in the most holy place. Uh, you can't contain God in a box. Uh, that box was a man-made symbol, a, a model like you might make a model of a train or a car. Uh, but it was a model of something true, which means it did mean something. Uh, the reason they couldn't just waltz inside uh, was because it was representing something supremely great. It showed that God really was present with them, uh, and these were the steps that had to be gone through in order to uh, obtain uh, and achieve access uh, to him. It showed that he cannot be around sin, and where there is sin, uh, blood is needed to pay for that sin. Verse 22 tells us that the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Blood is needed to pay for sin. But the problem was the blood of the goats and calves didn't last. Everything that went on in the holy place was only temporary. It taught what needed to be done, but it was only a model. The most holy place was a wonderful representation of something that was real. But Jesus didn't go there. He went into the real thing, into heaven itself. 
And we see in our verse that this means he went into the very presence of God. Uh, Literally, uh, to appear to the face of God. Where is Jesus now? He is in heaven before the face of God. That is where he still is now. He entered there when he ascended and he is still visible there now. And he is there because his earthly mission was successful. He didn't sin. He lived a perfect life. And that meant that his sacrifice was accepted by God. And as verse 25 says, it didn't need to keep at being repeated. You see, if Jesus had sinned, he couldn't have gone back to heaven. Not only would he not have saved us, but he would have condemned himself. But he didn't. He didn't sin. He lived a perfect life, and that is how he gained access into heaven itself, where he continues to be seated now at the right hand of God. An appearance in heaven. And we've seen that Jesus appeared in heaven. And now we'll see uh, what that achieves. An appearance in heaven achieves for us access uh, to God. An appearance in heaven achieves for us access uh, to God. Uh, So why did he go there? Was Jesus' mission complete uh, so he went home for some rest and relaxation? for some R&R. I think that's what I've often thought, even if I wouldn't have put it quite like that. But I was so encouraged when preparing this uh, to bask in this truth that that is not why he went to heaven. You see, Jesus didn't go uh, for himself. He didn't run back to heaven saying, I am so glad I've managed to get off earth. I am so glad that's over with. Like a soldier who serves wholeheartedly while on tour, but as soon as the mission is complete and she gets to go home, she jumps on that plane and rightly heaves a huge sigh of relief, knowing that it is job well done, and now she can go home to her family, to a proper bed, to a proper food, in peace. That isn't why Jesus went back. Jesus was not on earth thinking, I can't wait till this is over with and I can get out of this messed up place. You see, his job wasn't complete. It still isn't. He still has work to do. No. Jesus didn't go for himself. He said, have a look at what it says in verse 24. The writer of Hebrews says to his fellow Christians that he went for us. On our behalf. The fact that we can't see him here on earth anymore is because he is performing his role as our high priest. And to do that, he has to be in the presence of the Father. Just like the high priest used to go behind the curtain once a year on behalf of the people to atone for their sins. So Jesus is not behind the curtain, but in heaven itself for us. He's there for us on our behalf. It was for our benefit that he went. Isn't that mind-blowing? The second half of verse 26 It says that he appeared on earth once for all to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's why his blood had to be poured out. His blood wasn't needed to to gain access for himself. Remember, blood is needed where there is sin. And he didn't sin. He could have gone back to heaven without dying quite easily. But he poured out his blood so that he could gain access on our behalf so that our sin could be put away that's why he sacrificed himself so that having sacrificed himself he could appear in heaven for us 
He appeared on earth at that first Christmas over 2,000 years ago to become a sacrifice so that he could appear in heaven for us. But notice also at the other word here. He went for us, for our benefit. He did not go against us. He did not go to the Father and say, I've seen how bad they are and we should not let them in. No. He's there for us. He's there reminding the Father that he died for us. He's sitting next to the Father saying, you see, Joe, well, I died for her. She can come to you. And you see, Dale, well, I've made him clean too. And you see, Drew, well, my blood has taken away his sin. You can let him in. He's doing that constantly over and over and over and over again. If you are a Christian here today, then he is doing that for you right now. And not just that, but he's also rebuffing any accusations that Satan tries to throw against you. When Satan tries to accuse, Jesus is just knocking it away. When Satan says to the Father, oh no, you can't let them in, didn't you see when they, Jesus just knocks it away and says, no, that is false evidence, Satan. It has been dealt with. He's like the lawyer who works tirelessly to prove your innocence. Or like the boss who you know has your back, that even when you mess up, you know that he will stand up for you. Think of someone that you have known who has been for you. Think how that made you feel. Jesus is for you, Christian. He's for you. And it's because he's doing this now that he can save you. Hebrews 7, 25 says, therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Uh, intercede means to speak on someone's behalf, especially when they are unable to speak uh, for themselves. Uh, Jesus can save you completely, this verse says, because he lives to intercede for you to speak for you in the ways that we've already seen. That is not to downplay his death in any way, but his interceding applies his sacrificial death. They go together and we need both. We needed him to become a once-for-all sacrifice, to pour out his blood, but we also need him to be in heaven for us. You see, all that Jesus is doing now is for you, Christian. And it is because of this, because he is interceding for you, that he has achieved unhindered access to God himself. He is before God's face for us, so that by his being there, we can be there too. We can draw near to God, coming before his face, and he won't turn us away. Not even Moses had that. I've often been jealous of Moses. He got to talk one-on-one -on -one with God like you would talk with a friend. That would have been pretty cool, right? Just listen to these verses from Exodus 34. Uh, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and, and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. Uh, but Moses called them to him. Um, but Moses called to them. And so Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and he spoke to them. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, 
he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. And then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. His face became so radiant and bright after speaking to God that he had to cover it up. It was too much for the people to look at. They were scared. Just imagine that. Imagine what that was like for Moses, being able to talk to God in this way. Imagine the privilege that Moses had. But Moses couldn't see God's face. In the chapter before, Moses had asked to see God's glory And God obliged and said he would pass before him, but, he said, that you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And so God covered Moses up until he had passed by, and then he uncovered him so that he could see his back. With all the privileges that Moses had, he couldn't see God's face. And also, he didn't have access into heaven itself, but just into a tent, a copy of the real thing. Now, this is what blew me away when preparing this. Our verse says that Jesus now appears before the face of God for us. He has achieved access to God's face for us. We have greater access to God than Moses did. I'll be honest, I just don't have the words. I can't imagine being able to speak to God like Moses did, and yet, I can. I can. And it's an access that can't be denied. We can't get turned away from him because Jesus is there interceding for us, saying, no, let them in. We have free, unhindered access into the very presence of God. And that is all through Jesus. This applies to the final judgment day. We will have nothing to fear if we are in Jesus None of his people will have to worry about whether God will let them in or not. It's like we have a VIP pass, no questions asked. But it also applies now. We can come before God now. When you pray, you get straight through to God himself. Imagine having the direct telephone number for the Oval Office in the White House, and not to the switchboard, and not to his assistant, but straight to the very desk where the president sits. Well, brothers and sisters, let me tell you this. Our access is far greater than access to the president of the United States of America. Our access is to the Alpha and the Omega. The creator of all things. The sustainer of life. The one who flung stars into space. The one who set the earth spinning and sent it off to orbit the sun. The one who commands rain and it rains. The one who controls the seas. The one who breathes life into every living thing. The one who feeds the birds of the air. The one who clothes the flowers in such beauty and splendor. Our access is to the king of the universe. Now that is who we have access to. So let me ask you. Do you pray? Do you pray knowing that this is who you are speaking to? You're not speaking to an answer phone where your message might get listened to at some point if he gets round to it. When you pray, you are speaking directly to God himself. And you have his full attention. 
And that is all because Jesus is there in his presence for you. So when you pray, uh, do you pray like Philip, uh, who knows that he should pray? He'll feel guilty if he doesn't, uh, but he's distracted. Uh, His phone carries more of his attention. Uh, There's a World Cup game on, and, well, he must keep up with the score. Uh, He mentions a few people from church to God. Uh, Now he can tell them he's been praying for them. And then he gets cut off because uh, there's been a goal, and, well, he thinks that was enough. It satisfied his conscience uh, for another day. Or do you pray like Hannah, who knows who she is bowing before, And she knows that he is listening. And so she puts away all distractions and she focuses her heart on him. She pours herself out knowing that she is talking to the God of the universe. Knowing that Jesus is there interceding for her. Knowing that even when words fail her, the spirit will intercede on her behalf. At that moment in time, there is nowhere else that she would rather be. Don't do yourself out of one of the greatest privileges that there is. Recognize who you're coming before. Know that he is listening intently. And enjoy getting to sit in his presence through Jesus. Uh, Knowing that Jesus has achieved access to God for us, it means that when we pray, we get straight through to God. Uh, But it also means that when you mess up and sin, uh, Jesus is there saying to the Father, I paid for that too. He just wipes it clean off your slate. Uh, Do you know that? If you have repented and are trusting him, then nothing else needs to be done. Because Jesus is in the presence of God for you. That sin that you committed again need not bear you down. Oh, tackle it. Do confess it and seek God's help to tackle it. But don't let it grind you down. Because Jesus is with God. He doesn't hold it against you. And so don't hold it against yourself. Don't you see how wonderful this is? Don't you see that there is nowhere better that Jesus could be? He finished his work on earth. No more sacrifices are needed. But his work in heaven keeps on going. We need him there. And that is where he is. And that is where he will remain until, verse 28, he comes again when... Verse 28 says, he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. When Jesus returns, he will bring salvation for us. And he will take us fully into God's presence to live with him forever. You see, it is precisely because Jesus is in heaven that we can have such great assurance that we have access into God's presence. There is no need to doubt. Because Jesus is there, we have access there now and we will be there physically in the future. So take heart, Christian. Jesus is working for you and one day he will take you home. If you're not a Christian, then he is not currently in heaven for you. But he could be. I hope you see that all I've been saying could be true for you. He can intercede for you. It is only his sacrifice and his work as a priest now that can achieve access into God's presence for you. So won't you trust in Jesus' sacrifice and let him work for you now bringing you into God's presence an appearance in heaven achieves for us access to God and we're going to enjoy that access now by by, by coming before the face of God 
uh, in uh, prayer uh, through Jesus. Uh, I'm going to pray now um, before we uh, then sing uh, our, our closing song of Before the Throne of God Above. Um, but as I pray, this isn't just me praying. Uh, this is something that we are all uh, joining in with. Uh, we can all come into God's presence now in prayer. Um, so could I suggest that if you are able to, uh, that you stand, uh, sometimes being in a different fi uh, position physically uh, can help us to realise mentally that something different is going on. It can help us, help to remind us of who we are coming uh, before. Uh, and after I've prayed, uh, we'll sing before the throne of God above. Uh, so please do stand, if you're able to, and let's come before God's face together into his presence and enjoy the access that we have uh, through Jesus. Let's pray. O oh God of the universe, the Alpha and the Omega, the creator of all things, We come before you and bow ourselves at your feet in amazement that we can come into your presence before your face. Thank you so much that you welcome us in and you do not turn us away because Jesus is there with you right now interceding for us on our behalf allowing us in what an awesome privilege this is thank you so much that we can come before you and talk to you that we have greater access to you than even Moses did Lord we praise you and worship you we have no right within ourselves to come before you. We only deserve uh, for you to send us far away, to strike us down in judgment. And yet you do. You welcome us in. Because Jesus is with you. His blood uh, gave him access to you on our behalf and now he is with you interceding for us letting us in how we praise you and worship you thank you so much for Jesus thank you for all that he did when he was here on earth thank you that we can soon celebrate um, when Jesus came to earth as a baby thank you that he then lived that perfect life that he didn't sin and thank you that that meant that when he poured out his blood, he could do so on our behalf. That you could accept his sacrifice and allow us in. And thank you that he is now working for us. That he is with you now. That he allows us in. That he he wipes our slates clean that he takes away our sins so that we can come before you and be seen as righteous as holy we can be seen with his sinlessness we praise you my father and worship you help us to remember the wonderful privilege that this is Help us to enjoy this privilege throughout this coming week. Help us to remember who we are coming before. And help us, as we um, seek to enjoy this privilege, help us to grow closer to you. Uh, to love you more, to love uh, your son more and more each day. Uh, because of all that he is continuing to do for us now. We thank you and we praise you. Amen. Uh, well, we're going to um, close our service now uh, by singing uh, Before the Throne of God.
uh, remembering how we can become, how we can come uh, before uh, God's throne through Jesus. Let's sing together. <laughs>